All right, well, this is Aaron Squire coming to you guys again. And uh, tonight, I've got a champion with me, a champion. And uh, it's Zubrin. You guys might know him from the uh, forums over at the, uh, the Reddit forums. He's one of the moderators over there. He's been on two turns ahead quite a lot. Uh, we'll also be talking about Patch 828, uh, an RNG article, and we'll be de deck doctoring a Skarn deck. So let's just go ahead and jump right in here. And uh, Zubrin, the champion, what was it like? you got to tell me what was it like to win such a large tournament. I mean, it's like a seven round. It's almost an eight round tournament. I mean, I've always wanted to do that well. Uh, the best I've ever done is uh, whatever the last tournament I had. I was in the top eight, which is pretty crazy for me. So uh, just tell me what was it like. Well, it was incredibly nerve-wracking, especially once you get to around round six or seven and you know you're on the bubble. Any match could be the difference between coming back the next day or staying or just going home and relaxing. And then as soon as you know you're in the top eight or not in the top eight, either you now have a lot of free time on your hands, which is fantastic, or you spend the next several four or five hours testing every single matchup you expect to have, especially the matchup you're going to have immediately, and just trying to make sure you know the ins and outs of what you should be playing against those other decks. So it's thrilling, exciting, but also incredibly stressful. Right. Right, yeah, because you've got to move, counter-move everybody else that's in there. So uh, what's your biggest win? Is this your biggest win? I mean, this was a seven-round tournament. We had, like, what, close to 100 people in there. That's a, that's a pretty big win. Um, it's obviously my biggest hex win. It's the biggest hex tournament we've had to date besides the month-long uh, HP tournament we had in January. Mm -hmm. um, as far as my biggest win in terms of competitive play, probably not, though it's definitely right up there. The biggest win of a game I've had was something called WoW Minis. It was a game run by Upper Deck Entertainment, which is something that a lot of the Cryptozoic people came from. It was a miniatures game, uh, very competitive, and they only the game didn't last that long, but they had one Continental Championship and one World Championship, and I'm proud to say that I'm the sole North American Continental Championship uh, winner of well, yeah, the the Continental Champion of that. In fact, I have this fantastic trophy Whoa. right here. Whoa! <laughs> That wow. I can use as a uh, murder weapon if I ever, you know, <laughs> need to because it's just that hefty. But uh, Cryptozoic knows how to do trophies, or at least, well, they still do as well because they gave out so, so, several of these for WoW TCG as well. But yeah, wow. no, that was still a pretty decent win uh, for Hex, and it's fantastic. I was happy to be able to do it. It kind of reminds me of seeing people from the old Guts show. Like, those people are grown up now, and they still have their pieces of the aggro crag. That's what that kind of reminds me of. Of course, it doesn't light up. but <laughs> So uh, that segues me to um, uh, some of your, uh, basically, TCG experience or even experience in the different, like, um, games where basically you have to buy random packs of things. We, you know, we've seen this with uh, some of the uh, miniatures games and stuff. So just tell me about uh, some of your background. Uh, I've been playing TCGs probably since I, well, I know exactly when I started playing. I started playing in the sixth grade, where I walked downtown at some point and looked inside a card shop and saw these wonderful, weird-looking cards that were in a booster pack in the card shop window. And this was sixth grade. This was probably 1995 or so. I thought, hmm, I, that looks fun. I don't know what it is, but I want to buy it and own it. And I've been playing collectible card games and strategy games ever since, more or less. Uh, in various forms. Card games are where I grew up, really, more or less, cut my teeth, but also playing mini games, especially the WoW minis game, also playing some Warhammer as well, and that one's not really collectible in the same sense. Well, you get to uh, buy then, your rares in, in Warhammer, and they're very expensive, and it's it's a very much a painting as much as it is a playing game. But, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have, I have the sort of the same background. I mean, I started with Star Wars, and unfortunately I didn't go straight into Magic. Otherwise, I'd have cards that are worth money as opposed to cards that are worth nothing. Which uh, Star Wars? <laughs> uh, the, yeah, I mean, it's Star Wars. I mean, it's, it's, it can be difficult to find, and there's like an underground that still plays it. the old it. Decipher one? The old Decipher one, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, all sitting that. behind me. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I went from uh, Magic to Rage, which was White Wolf, I believe. Right. Then to Star Wars and Lord of the, or Legend of the Five Rings, and yeah. I have several TCGs between Magic and here. In fact, I sold my entire Magic collection during Ice Age because I thought this game is dying. There's no way my cards are going to have value in a couple <laughs> years from now. Wow. It was an excellent so financial pulled, decision for a 12-year-old to make. <laughs> you pulled a tad out, didn't you? <laughs> yeah. 
Or also, I think uh, Corey has some of the similar stories with his uh, <laughs> I wrote on a mox and used it for a phone number card uh, right. <laughs> to, to keep track of a phone number. So, um, the pound jewel in my collection was a Beta Chaos Orb, which was only about 80 bucks at the time. I have no idea. It would hurt, it would pain me like to look up how much that is. It's $300 now, I think. It's not crazy. Um, it's not like Mox or, or uh, yeah. Lotus, Lotus Value or anything. But um, So uh, just real quick, tell me how you prepared for this tournament, and then do you have any predictions going forward for the next tournaments as far as really like, what's going to be strong? Prepared. Yeah, so the preparation for this tournament probably started back in June, <laughs> oddly enough, because the version of the deck I was playing, our very first version of this deck, we cobbled together in around June 15th of 2013, when we built a working version of Hex on Cockatrice. By working, I mean you could play cards, and then you have to use your imagination to run a lot of the effects. And the right. deck in all our testing, even with I of Creation, it was the most consistent deck was a, a Diamond Blood deck. And this is a deck we've been testing throughout Alpha as much as we can. And I played a very similar version deck and a version of the deck in January for the January tournament. Sadly, only going six and two then, but it was a top uh, sixteen place finish. And so we really like this deck. By we, I mean the people I play with, which is a bunch of close friends I've had for the last fifteen years who really are into. TCGs and other types of games, and a couple weeks before the tournament, we were testing all the combinations that we could, and we knew I of Creation was going to be a very strong contender, though we probably didn't predict the best version of I of Creation, it's one that we significantly tested against, as well as the blue and black deck that we saw both in, well, in octave, or quarterfinals and semifinals, top eight and top four. Right, And so with my other teammates and I, we tested the deck significantly. And the biggest thing that we talked about are usually minor additions or subtractions. Uh, there was no real debate about whether or not Vampire King was going to be main deck or not. He was relegated to a sideboard pretty early on. Yeah. A uh, big debate was whether or not we should run 25 versus 26 resources. Mm. And usually, like, should we have three angels or four angels? And it was really minor tweaking for the most part to try to maximize our competitive edge against every single deck we thought we might go against. Right. And you see that a lot with a lot of the competitive groups. Like, you'll see them play the same deck, and then people will make their choices for different things. Like, someone else might play four Angel of Dawn, whereas you played three. And that, that mm -hmm. you see that quite often with play groups. Yeah. So, uh, predictions going forward on the meta? So, I both tweeted this as well as posted on the forums about this. And right now, I see the meta as a rock, paper, scissors type of setup where we have Blood Diamond versus Blood Sapphire versus Eye of Creation. And I think Eye of Creation beats Blood Diamond most of the times. Like in my finals matchup, I don't think I win that matchup if it's a best of five or a best of seven. Right. I think I got two stellar hands, and his hands were less stellar, and his pulls from I have creation were not as optimal as he would have liked. Right. And I think the Blood Diamond deck has a very favorable matchup against Blood Sapphire, and Blood Sapphire has a favorable matchup against um, against I have creation. And I really see those as the top three decks in the meta. The thing we're waiting for is something that can beat both Control and I have creation. And so there's something that's a mid-range deck, but not too slow of a mid-range deck. It has to be aggro-ish that could potentially unseat Eye of Creation and give a lot of trouble to control decks. Maybe it's Red Green, maybe it's Blood Red. I'm not entirely sure yet, but I have yet to see the deck that can do well against both types of cards. Right. Well, I would think that Mono Ruby would be very good against Eye of Creation, um, but uh, Inquisitor just kind of like stomps it down uh, on mm -hmm. the other side of the metagame. So, I mean... That's what I had in my last match. I, I finally played against a Ruby deck, and it was it was nice. It was vindication from last tournament when I got stomped so hard uh, in the top eight. <laughs> yeah. I remember that well. <laughs> it was, yeah. I'll well, your first remember. game, you had like a five-resource hand and two, four, or five-cost spells, and you're like, oh, I think I'll keep this. And it's like, by the way, I'm playing Ruby Aggro. I win. I was like, oh. Yeah. Well, I knew what everyone was playing because I knew the deck lists. But, um, yeah. Yeah. So, so interesting thing uh, about this is this is the deck that you played, and um, this is more, I would say, what, troop heavy? Um, and you're playing Zared, which is going to give you more control factors than the one I, I chose to play at the beginning. I started trying to play this one. Uh, I'll just show this to the audience real quick. And basically, I'm running Kranich for the uh, card draw. It's a lot more control y, like I'm running Solitary Exile. I actually swapped. Uh, for three Inquisition over Spearcliff Cloud Knight, I'm playing four Angel of Dawn, Resurrection, 
Uh, the defender has the gem where it is that it'll resurrect my guys. Um, totem, uh, of course, uh, repel. I really, really don't like. Um, I still, still don't like soul marble. So I don't. I have a hard time running it. I know it's good. <laughs> uh, Inquisitor. You don't like soul marble. I really. I, it's just the wind up time on it. I think that's. I always feel like I'm gonna die before I get it all fully wound up. Uh, Inquisitor. Um, of course, I can't play Blood without playing Relentless Corruption, which is an interesting interaction with Aspirant, because you know you can just basically infinitely draw Relentless Corruption and make your opponent draw out while still possibly top decking that Angel. Um, mm -hmm. That was another thing that was interesting to me was Relentless Corruption plus Angel uh, means that I could still top deck it uh, because I'm not drawing my own cards. Uh, right. Two Murder and then the Two Extinction. Um, but it, the thing is, I wasn't drawing enough cards. That was the biggest thing I had, and uh, very similar to your deck um, with the same-ish problems, because your your deck also is not going to draw a lot of cards. So, um, very it interesting. It draws no cards. Yeah, yours does. Yours draws, for, for every card I draw, you draw none. So, I guess yeah. there is that. I think you probably need to reevaluate Soul Marble. I mean, you recognize that as a good card, but it fulfills a very functional role in the control matchup and the whole point of it except for against side creation against every single other deck you get early turn two soul marble out there and you play one creature at a time this gives you playability for extinction and it makes them really hard for them to deal with your one creature because they have to extinction to get rid of it assuming you have soul armaments out and so most of my game plan is to put angel out there and swing until I win or they get rid of or it and put a living kill them out Right. Or then put out Inquisitor. Right, yeah. And a 5 3 Inquisitor a is way better than a 3 1. Right. So, uh, moving on to the articles. There's a couple different articles today that were uh, released in Hex. Of course, we have the uh, patch breakdown. But before we talk about that, we're going to talk about randomization. And a lot of people on the forums have been going back and forth about how random things are. Basically, in computers, Nothing is truly random, but there are seeds and basically random numbers that are uh, gone. They basically put them through procedures. Really good article, a really smart guy. This is actually, I believe this is the guy that uh, John said that he wanted to play. If he could play anybody on the Cryptozoic team, he wanted to play against this Alan Com Comer, who uh, seems like a really smart guy. It's a really good read. I I'd suggest you guys do it if you have any um, questions about uh, randomization and how random things are. A big part of randomization and finding out if things are truly random is the sample size you're looking at because people on the forums will post, oh, we did a thousand games. Well, he's doing sample sizes of 10,000 or 100,000 or even a million games and he's doing this with the computer where he can set it up so the, the AI plays the AI and do, does a bunch of things and he's finding there's a significant uh, amount of randomness uh, as far as what you would expect. Um, that the game is fine for randomness. Um, anything to add with that, Zubrin? I think generally his intuition as well as the statistical tests he's done are very... They're detailed and informative in such a way that I haven't had many... This lays to rest some of the questions I had, but I don't think I had any questions to begin with. Right. Randomness does mean that you're going to get some weird results and some results in a row because some of the time that actually does happen. So I'm not overly surprised by that. And I, I didn't have questions before. I'm very familiar with statistics and it, everything seemed to be generally normal to me. And then this will give additional information to those who have doubts. Now, this won't solve all issues because people are always going to have doubts, but this should at least resolve some of the inquiries that people had prior to this. Right. So, yeah, nope. like, I remember in one of the original things when they had, uh, was it Hex Engine or whatever it is? Not Hex Engine. The, um, the one that creates stuff every turn. Like, it's, a, it's an artifact. The Inspiration. Inspiration Engine. So they had that thing leveled up, and it was creating the same artifact every turn because it wasn't being yeah. seeded properly. And uh, so when you set a seed, usually you do it on time. Like, so you'll do it actually faster than, like, every second. So that way, every time it's generating a random number, it's on that seed. Um, so it, it will jam generate different random numbers. Well, they didn't have it set to, like, probably every second. They probably had it to every turn, so you actually had to flip turns back and forth to get a new card on the random uh, card that Inspiration Engine would give you. <laughs> so that's an example of when random isn't programmed correctly. Um, you'll, you'll get the same uh, result, like, almost every time. You'll also notice this, like, if you try to do a random playlist... Um, if you use the random in like Windows Media Player, it'll jump around to the same random random 
um, songs over and over again. So instead of doing that, what you want to do is randomize the whole playlist and play it all the way through. And so that's a lot of the time what it is that you do is we have these uh, what they call shuffle numbers. And I don't know if they're using that. I don't think that they are. It sounds like they're using some sort of a method or an algorithm um, to do that. Uh, where, but shuffle numbers is basically you have a table of numbers that were already gener uh, generated randomly, and you basically rotate through the numbers. So, so some different things for you, you people at home. Also, uh, when we're talking about random numbers, another thing I'd like to point out is when we're shuffling in real life, a lot of times we're not truly doing it randomly because we'll do things like pile shuffling, which is not random at all. So, uh, right. Zubrin had a quick comment and on by the, itself uh, is illegal in very games. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. So, so it's we'll, illegal in Magic if you just pile shuffle. You have to randomize through Ripple Shuffle and other mechanisms. Right, exactly. So we'll move to the uh, Hex uh, breakdown. So exciting times today. Everyone on their Hex accounts needs to log in this weekend at some point in time. Open some packs. They're test packs. You have 4,000 Platinum to, to spend in the store which uh, you don't necessarily uh, want to spend it on the deck because the deck is going to give you empty cards, I believe. So don't do it there, but definitely spend it on the packs. You're, and you have a chance of pulling the um, primal packs, although the graphics aren't showing up properly as I understand it. So yeah. definitely go in and uh, open up some packs. Um, the, another big one is the best of three timer that I've been talking about forever. Um, this is a big deal. So when you're playing Huge. in a tournament, it was resetting the timer every time because it was it was creating a new game. So they've at least started to make it so the timer carries over from game to game. This is going to uh, take some people by surprise because they're Good. not going to be used to it at all. No, I'm really happy that they finally fixed this because as a streamer, there's nothing worse than to broadcast dead air. And it would consistently do it worse. At least one of the games would often go to time and you would have to wait 45 minutes between one match and the next. And you can't have that as a streamer. So I don't want to boo up some other game that people don't care about. Right. And this will make both streaming and playing a more enjoyable enterprise. Right. I mean, you're going to have to play a much, much quicker game now to uh, make sure that you progress through your games properly. So... Uh, yeah, start making decisions faster. <laughs> uh, players can now correctly resocket cards in between games in a match between rounds and limited tournaments. Now, this was something where it was that this is this was you know maybe a uh, had, uh, maybe this was a question in some people's minds as to whether it is that this should have been allowed or not. Makes sense to me um, because in a limited setting, you, you you're going to be swapping cards in and out anyway. So why not allow people to switch gems? Per the situation. Now, in a constructed setting, I can't see that quite as much. Zubrin, do you have any thoughts on the switching of the gems? I thought there was going to be no chance that they actually allowed this to occur, so I'm kind of surprised to see it. And the main reason is because the gems themselves are not something you draft. You have access to all the gems, and this gives you a lot more deck building opportunities in between matches. So I see the appeal why. And one of the biggest things you're going to do is say you have a boulder brute or a uh, battle beetle in your hand and you now change it from a plus one plus one to a spell shield because you know your opponent's playing a lot of removal. Right. I generally see this as giving way too much power to be able to tech out your deck against other decks because you don't draft these these gems. You Instead, you are just granted them. And I'm perfectly fine with it and I understand why it's done, but I did not see it actually occurring, so I'm surprised Would by it. Would you be much more for them implementing this just for like um, release tournaments only, and then uh, in the typical uh, every other tournament style, basically not locking in gems once it is you've chosen your deck? Would you, would you be much more for that? Probably. I, I think gems should be locked in, but there also needs to be a clear warning that, warning that you did not socket your gems in the first place, because I think that's the biggest issue where someone forgot to socket and now they basically have a inferior card for the rest of their matches. Right. And right. having our release makes a lot of sense because people are trying things out new for the first time. And so right. having flexibility and less competitive environment makes a lot of sense to me. Right. In a typical release tournament, just so everyone's aware, in between rounds, because you have basically a sealed deck, you can switch your entire deck in between rounds. Um, you could actually do it in between games as well, if you actually, which some people do because they're, they like being silly. So those, they'll, they'll like, have like two decks made and they'll like swap the whole deck for like game two and three i guess or something but yeah. <laughs> but
But you can do that just to try out the cards because they want you to try out the cards and get used to them because not everybody goes in and they read all the spoilers to make sure they have the cards memorized. Another thing I, of course, advocate is memorizing cards, as always. Uh, so that's a big one. The pre-combat priority window is been re-implemented so it was never really gone they knew that it wasn't in there it was to help them smooth out the gameplay but it's been re-implemented so now before combat starts there's one more chance for you to start doing something which means that no longer uh could you do something right before like during the first main phase or or not at all type of thing so this is a really big deal because there's a lot of things you want to do in, in the pre-combat phase and not allow your opponent to still have uh, the ability to do basic action speed stuff, um, or what's sorcery speed, classically classically called sorcery speed in magic terms. Uh, Zubrin? Yeah, this makes a lot of sense to me because there's cards like Stormcall that are not so good if you have to do it during your main phase. It allows your opponent to play a creature with speed that they weren't going to play before, or do something that allows you to untap your creatures, like One-Eyed Open. And so being able to be, cast something like Stormcall in the pre-combat priority phase is essential for the health of the game and the design space of the game. I'm glad right. it's back in. Right, me too. So moving on. So we've got a bunch of new cards which we're going to talk about in a couple minutes, and we got all the rest of the gems. And in fact, as of right now, as of this patch, as of today, we can mark it, all the cards are in the game. All the cards Ooh. for this set. I mean, it's a big deal. Everyone should be excited. You guys should be like out in the streets like I don't know, cheering. We should like put it, ha like if you come over to my house tomorrow, maybe we'll have a cookout or something. Maybe. Okay, so moving on. Sure. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mentioned on Twitter that I thought this week was going to be a milestone week, and I'm glad to be proven right with my prediction. Though it's not beta, it's still very close to it. We're on the doorsteps, I think. Oh, yeah. It, it definitely, they're showing that they are ready to go to this beta um, probably on April 1st, possibly even. I mean, or at least by the end of the first week of April. So a uh, couple of changes that were made. Big, big nerf to Chimes of the Zodiac. So Chimes of Zodiac is now unique. So you can no longer have two of them in play because it'll just kill the old one and the other one will go to your uh, graveyard. And it got double nerfed. Double nerfed because you uh, go down to... I might have to search it out, but wherever it is... Um, I'm going to have to search for it. Doppelgadget, yeah. I'm, let's just do a search. Control F. That's going to be the fastest way. Doppel... Yeah, so Doppelgadget now reads, at the start of your turn, you may transform this artifact into a replica of a non-shapeshifter artifact with four or less cost that you control. So you can no longer Doppelgadget your, um, <laughs> your uh, Chimes of Zodiac. And it, it was going to be a replica, so like the uniqueness wouldn't have mattered because we've, we all know about replicas and uniqueness doesn't matter to replicas. So you will no longer have double... Uh, Chimes of Zodiac in play, so your opponent won't be able to play like um, whatever it is, the time, uh, the one that gives you extra turns. You, the, you'll no longer have that happen where you, your opponent will take like four turns off of playing that card once. Um, There's still one way you can do it. Dwarves. You get the cost below four, or get it four or less, and then you might be able to get your couple of Chimes, but so definitely changes the entire way in which you build yeah, that deck now. For however is clunky, it was already super clunky to get that oh, to yeah. happen. But that's what you're talking about is like six cards right now in play at the same time, sure. which is like virtually impossible <laughs> against a human oh. player that's that's alive and kicking. Um, <laughs> so the deck you only use for round one and round two. You get so, the competitive decks later. It's possible that Chimes was creating what what you would call a negative play experience, and that's why they decided to do this. Zubrin, you also had uh, something to talk about with that. Uh, well, the main issue was potentially Doppelgadget. Is I don't think that they thought Doppelgadget was causing a negative play experience. There's a couple things that can no longer actually copy, including Chimes. Uh, Drew's is a big one that can no longer copy that people it's were doing deal. it with. Yeah, and so I think Mantic mentioned this earlier on the Hextex cast that he said that they were doing it potentially for design space in set 2 and set 3, and that it wasn't really because of any interactions that they had in set 1. Which I buy that. That's believable. Sure. Which also means that they might, they should be thinking about that for I creation as well. But that's a different topic. Well, they already made it so I creation can't recast itself. So I mean, at least they did that for us. Sure. Uh, Blood cold and ritualist now reads sacrifice a troop and he becomes five five. So we got a minor buff. So Shin here get a buff. Yay. Um, I actually 
earlier today I was trying to play Shin here with that new plus two, plus two, um, whatever it's called in, in Diamond. And it wasn't too bad. Uh, there's there's some room there. I can turn four somebody, so it's not too bad. Um, I can do 18 damage on turn four, possibly. But, I mean, it, it's like everything, like the moon has to align. Or, yeah, the moons? The stars have to align. Whatever. The planets? Whatever has yes, whatever's out sense. in outer space, that stuff has to align for you to get that to happen. To get that, like... I mean, it's not too bad. I mean, I have to basically... Turn one, I have to play the guy that makes more dudes for for tokens. Then turn two, I play like maybe some tokens, and then turn three, do something else like the buff guy. And then after that, basically play the uh, thing that gives all the guys plus two plus two, all my tokens, and swing swing away. So it's it's interesting. It's tokeny. Uh, I don't know. I might try it. Um, work on it a little bit more because I, I want Shin Hair to happen. They're pretty popular. <laughs> At what level do you want them to happen? You want them to be a competitive deck or a somewhat competitive deck? I want them to at least be a tier two deck. At okay, least, that's reasonable. at least be a tier two deck where it's like Kithkin used to be. You know, so at mm-hmm. least be at that level um, where it is that it's cheap. Uh, new players can build it. It's easy to sure. play, and um, they can win games with it, like uh, against tier one decks. So. You know, given the right circumstances. So moving on, moving on to some of the uh, cards, new cards of the week. We got the time bug, the final cards. We're going through them now. We're gonna count it down. We got the time bug. Mm. We've seen this guy before. Really, no changes to him since what we've seen before. Um, basically, you can shuffle them into your deck if they deal damage. If you shuffle two of them, you take an additional turn. There's a way to do some sort of infinite combo with it because you take an extra turn, and then you draw into two extra and do some other stuff. Chances are pretty good it's not going to happen for you. Um, in draft, I mean, it's a 1-1 one, one flyer. It's decent. It is an artifact. It's an insect. It's not a um, construct, so that's kind of a drawback. You can't really use it for activations on your Volcanon. Um, no. Yeah, Zubrin, thoughts? No, I'm not overly excited about this. There's some PvE stuff that this card was good for, but... <laughs> I can't imagine a deck that I would play in it competitively. I can't imagine some that are fun. And that's oh, yeah. probably also when they print Jankbot. It will be another time I'm playing Timebot. Well, Jankbot I would actually play in, <laughs> in Limited. This I would probably sure. not. Um, but yeah, I do like the picture. Yeah. I think the art's great on it. Um, I love this. It's like the universe is in there. You know, it's kind of reminds me of the end of Men in Black. Yeah. So... <laughs> So moving on, we got Darkspire Priestess. Uh, it's an Orc Troop 2 with a 1 blood threshold, cost of 2. It's a 2-1. When it dies, choose one at random. I love how it says, choose one at random. It should just say, randomly. <laughs> uh, it deals 3 yeah. damage to opposing champion. Or search your deck for a troop with uh, Darkspire in its name and put it into your hand. So I don't know all the cards with Darkspire. Um, but this is kind of neat because this is almost like this is like the first tutor card that we've seen in the game. Although it only tutors things with Dark Spire, so it only tutors itself, I think, right now. Is there anything else with Dark Spire in the name? I can't think Not of anything. Not that I can think of offhand. But yeah, I'm sure one of our audience members. In fact, let's us. just let's just find out. Let's just find out right now. Dark Spire. So D-A-R-K. the choose at random mechanic is, I think, a holdover from Magic when you used to choose cards at random from your oh. opponent's hand. And so you will literally pick one from the back of it. Now you roll dice and things like that. And I think it's just a archaic way of saying something that doesn't make any sense. Right. So it should be the game randomly chooses. Oh, there is another one. So you can get a vanilla three-two uh, troop that costs three. This not makes that a lot great. more limited playable. But yes, m- definitely more limited playable. So not a bad card. I think that you could. It could definitely see some play. Maybe even some, um, you know, tier two play. Maybe. Oh, it's. So one of the decks that's kind of on the precipice of being competitive is the Rush Orcs deck, Blood, and or maybe Blood Red, but the best ones I've seen have been Blood so far. Right. And this card helps it get a little bit more traction. I don't think they're Tier 1 yet. I'm not sure if they're Tier 1 because of this card or not, but I think we'll see more of them now because of it. All right, so moving on to the next one, Pheromones, which is basically a lure type of card. It's cost 1, it's 1, uh, one uh, Wild Threshold. Target troop gets opposing troops and must block this tr- uh, this troop if able this turn. Now, the funny thing about this card is it's so simple, like the text. To me, being a, a Magic player, I remember the original Lure card had a wall of text to explain that. 
Uh, it was like, if it does this, they have to, and then and then you have to do this, and the damage gets dealt this way, and it, like, it went through this giant wall of text. I mean, it was like an instruction booklet on the card, and it's since been fixed, obviously, with magic terms, but uh, that's what that that's what cards with lure make me think of as, like, the original lure. I think that was an Ice Age when I had that, that card. <laughs> there was but, a version of it revised, but yeah. Yeah, I think I still have it in my collection somewhere. I should go find it. <laughs> I'll post it maybe to my Twitter or something if I find it. But um, yeah, it's a lure. Oh, so the it original revised version was pretty easy. It was the Ice Age one that was terrible. Oh, that's interestingly okay. enough. <laughs> yeah, the revised one says all creatures able to block enchant creature do so. Okay, well that <laughs> that makes sense. So a great card to maybe throw on your fist or bring it on. Although he does seem to be falling out of graces these days, as we have much bigger things to eye of creation into. Um, but um, it's, even in limited play, it's it's uh, it's removal. So I mean, it's removal your opponent sees coming, so they could murder in response or something. But there, it is removal, and it could also allow you to push through damage where it is that like you lure to like that one one, so all your opponent's stuff has to block it, and then you swing through with everything else and push through that lethal damage you need. So definitely a lot of different uh, good uses here for this card. Anything to add, Zubrin? I can see it in Constructed. I'm just not sure what deck beyond Eye of Creation. I'm not sure Eye of Creation wants to play, but I think it's something we may see in the future in Top 8. I'm just not creative enough right this second to figure out what that green deck is. Probably more of a sideboard card, I think. It's specific matchups you want it for. Uh, Moving on, we've got Reginald. Now, we a long time ago, we made a deck for this guy, uh, and so we might actually, I might actually try to bring that back and see if I can get it to work, but basically it had a lot of shuffling effects. So Reginald, Reginald costs three, he's a ruby threshold, he says, when Reginald deals damage to an opposing champion, shuffle him into their deck, and he gets permanent when Reginald enters your hand or graveyard, he destroys you. Then each champion draws three cards. So obviously he's played... Um, he's supposed to be for like multiplayer play. Uh, he's a 3-3. Three, it's three. a decent body. The big thing is you're going to need to get him some sort of evasion, so throw him in the air with some flying or uh, get him unblockable somehow or do something else with them. Um, it's, it's more of a flavorful Johnny-esque card. Um, pretty decent. Um, what do you think? What so color you did you play him in when you had him? Uh, well, I, I had him. Obviously, he's Ruby. Um, right. So I think it was Ruby... I have to look through my deck lists, actually. He's in one of these. I think that we named the deck after him, so hold on. Let's see if we got it. Uh, it's, a, it's a while ago now. Luckily, uh, I'm actually going to have this guy on tomorrow, the guy that did the TCG browser and deck builder. I'm going to have him on, so he'll be on next week. I'm going to be interviewing him, and it'll be recorded. But, uh, you know, uh, he just lets you just keep making decks. I mean, look at all my decks. Oh. <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to find it in here, though. Okay. So the issue with Reginald is that you want him in a deck where he's not your only target for spot removal, so they're using it on other cards. Right. And But you also can't use it in a Ruby Aggro deck because he's a basically pay three, do three damage next turn, and then he's out of the game. And so it's really hard for me to imagine a deck in which he's going to be successful and competitive at the same time. He's fun, and it, he's fun for you to play. I'm not sure he's fun for your opponent either because the drawing, if he's in the top half of your deck and your opponent draws him a turn or two later after you attack successfully with him, you're like, oh, the game's over. Okay, well, I guess that was fair. <laughs> yeah. And I guess good that job. Was fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. so I'm not a big fan of this card on either side of the table at the moment, but there's, I mean, I could see why it would be fun. It's probably going to be fun for PvE as well, but it's not my cup of tea. So, yeah, I think we, I put this together with, uh, I think it was Threshold Podcast. I, I, podcast. I think I did this with Josh. Um, so yeah, it was. There's a chimes in there, of course, because I think I was rolling with Josh and uh, Elder Streamer. I can't even remember what I socketed him with, but um, yeah, it was like an interesting deck concept. You kind of want to play with the card where it's like both players discard three and then draw three. You also have Fulmination in there to force your opponent to draw cards so they could draw into them. But the big thing is you need to get him that evasion, so we're running Feather, drifting downriver. And then we also had Heat Wave to, for the early board clear. It's interesting, I guess. We have a Tatalka in there. Yeah, it's whatever. <laughs> so, moving on, we've got a uh, quick issue to talk about, which may have been fixed already. We just had a quick patch today. Uh, so, the issue was that if you are mulling again, you will see cards. You'll see them on top of your deck, 
and your opponent's not seeing those. So don't worry about that. It may have been fixed anyways, but your opponent won't see it. It's client side. It's not actually like server side, and they can't see it anyways. So um, not too much else to talk about that. Uh, moving on, we've got the, the new gem. So three new gems, the double ruby, and I think that these are all major, I believe. They're all major, right, Zubrin? Um, I actually didn't check that, so now yeah. I have to double check. Yeah, I don't know. Do they all say prime? Uh, they 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 say yeah. They don't say prime or anything. They might mm. not be. Okay, so the first one is Ruby of Flames. This this troop can't be blocked except by artifact troops and or troops that share a shard with it, which is kind of interesting to me because this is classically in Magic terms something you would see more in like the Blood Shard and that Black Shard. Of course, other colors did get it eventually, and it became Intimidate, I believe. Uh, but you know, it's interesting that Ruby is becoming the shard where it's like, you will not be able to block me because I'm going to scare you and just charge right over you like a linebacker. <laughs> uh, Subrin, thoughts on the uh, Ruby of Flames? What was the original magic card you said that was? Kind of uh, like, it was it was on a lot. It was uh, Fear, I believe, was you can't be blocked oh. except for artifact yeah, yeah. and then black creatures. That was the original keyword. Um, sure. It was mostly only on black creatures, but then they changed it to Intimidate. And so it was right. basically, unless you're the same as me, you can't block me unless you're an artifact. It's really weird that it's in Ruby. I imagine people are going to play this in Limited quite a bit, just especially on artifact creatures, because now only artifact creatures can block your artifact creatures. Um, it makes and, them more popular, for sure. Plus, like yeah. the change to Murder helps out a lot. Yeah, I'm not sure how popular this is going to be. You want a socket creature that has some other effect when it does damage, so... For example, the Elf Archer that gets plus one, plus one, does damage to the opposing champion. This might be something you put in her so that she can get through everything but green and artifact oh, scout? troops. Well, it used to be yeah. Scout. Now it's... Is it Skirmisher? It's Skirmisher now. Yeah, that guy. Yeah, you know. Yeah, I can see that. Sure. Uh, next one is Sapphire Mischief. And, like, all the control players are, like, losing their minds now because they can finally play troops at quick action speed, which is like instant speed in magic terms. But this allows us to, to wait until the end of our opponent's turn and play that troop, or even better, we can play a troop now and during blockers and block with it, or actually it'll be... So after attackers are declared, you have to play it then, and then declare your blockers. You can't play it during blockers because you already passed the blocker phase. Right. But you want to play it then, and then block your opponent's dude, and... Uh, now now you've got a troop next turn and they lost a troop that they weren't prepared for for some reason and uh, yeah so it seems really good if you put this in like Elder Streamer because he's going to stick around but it's also really good if you're running uh, Inquisitor our, our mainstay although he's probably going to die every time and trade off so thoughts on this Zubrin? I think that the where this is probably going to shine as a control player I love that I have troops with flash now who can come in at instant speed is probably the blue-green deck and we haven't seen a lot of blue-green in the last tournament but I think it's still potentially viable. Uh, Frey was playing it and he was 5-1 going into round 7 before he played against me where you basically want to cast a Jadam and then time walk, or not time walk master your time a couple times afterwards to kill Jadam. Well having a troop that is instant speed such as Boulder Brute or the Battle Beetle who have a healthy body to block and then can attack next turn, or in the case of Battle Beetle, have evasion, evasion. and attack next turn, yeah. is fantastic. So Amazing. I see this as a fantastic card to put Blue Green maybe back on the map. I hope. More diversity I'm a fan of. The, the, apparently the natives are getting restless, of course. Uh, <laughs> I offered them donuts tomorrow. I don't know why they're not being quiet. All right, Blood Orb of Deception. Uh, next one, Double Blood. When this troop becomes blocked by a troop, that troop gets permanent minus one attack, minus one defense. So it's like leeching the life out of it, although you aren't gaining that life. But, you know, you have the Vampire King for that. So Deem seems pretty decent. I might even, you know, this is another one you could throw in. I, it's, I wonder if this seems like more of a minor gem. You could probably throw it in the Inquisitor or in something else. Uh, the, 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 what's the guy? The 2-2. Two -two where he deals two damage to you when he comes into play. You can probably put it in him if it's a if it's a minor. I'm not sure if it's a minor. But um yeah, thoughts on that? I don't have any too creative thoughts on it at the moment. It's something that seems like a necessary ability. It'll be great to have in the game. Some type of it's like a corruption effect, I guess. Um right. and, or like a poison almost. Yeah. I hope I'll they never do poison, by the way. It. No poison, Cryptozoic. <laughs> poison uh, is so that, annoying. Yeah. 
So you want to play against a deck that has a lot of one health creatures. And this seems like you probably are playing against other blood decks then who have Corpse Fly or Zentoth. And they're probably just not going to block you because they don't want to kill their creatures. So I, I have to think about this one a lot more to figure out how it fits into my decks. Uh, real quick, the last uh, one. We've got two new champions that are working properly, I guess. So we've got uh, Tetzat, son of Omek. Uh, he costs, you have to have at least one ruby threshold. Uh, he costs six. Reveal the top ten cards of your deck. Then create a rock elemental, and, it's, and it gets permanent plus one attack and defense for each resource revealed this way. Then put that rock elemental into play. Shuffle the revealed cards in your deck. So this, to me, screams... Uh, we want you to try to play wild ruby uh, ramp decks. We want you to do that because we know you're going to be running 25 or 26 resources. And so there's a very good chance. Typically, this guy is going to come out. He should be between a 4-4 and a 7-7, I would say. Somewhere in there when you're running that many resources. Uh, any thoughts on this, Zubrin? You seem to be a lot more excited about it. And what kind of decks do you want that in? Constructed deck or a limited deck? Or both? Um, probably constructed. Um, probably not okay. limited. I don't think. I've I mean, it is a single body. Limited. It can be handled, but uh -huh. and it does cost six, which is a lot. I have creation might help you get there, so it's another thing that I have creation can get you to. It, I'd rather play this than just gain five life. I'll tell you that much. Well, so the problem with five creation is that it takes the resources out of your deck. If I have creation was nerfed, so it no longer played resources, this would be a lot better for that reason. Um, it's but the gain life one, sure the whole reason that. why you play running deer is because you're worried about rush. And if rush is not in the meta, then this guy's going to be a lot better for you. Right. I've seen some people play in limited when it was still bugged and it had this fantastic effect where at the end of the turn it would kill your rock elemental and one of your troops randomly. And so every time I saw them play it, I was kind of thrilled because it means I probably won that game. But <laughs> other people seem to think this is a good limited uh, champion. And I'm not sure that's it's the big case. Body. Sure. It is, well, if you <laughs> if you see enough resources, it's a big body. Yeah. You have 17 in your deck. You, by this point, have played six. So you have 11 left in your deck, and they're interspersed with other creatures. Right, so Let's it could say, be up to a, typically a 4-4 four, four, or 5-5, five, five, yeah. I would say. And best. that's decent, but I would rather play uh, the green guy that gives you the uh, squirrel. Is it a squirrel? Yeah, because it's yeah guaranteed. Yeah. Right, yeah, you're right. I mean, that costs, what, eight, though? Yeah, but either one you're only going to play once, so it's only an issue of speed at this point. Right. So, so yeah, I think you're right. If you're playing this, you're probably playing it in Constructed. Yeah, I'd, I'd say so. But it's one of those things. I mean, you try it out, see if it works. It probably, it probably needs to have its uh, cost reduced from 6 down to 5, I would say. Mm -hmm. At least. Maybe even 4. 4 All might right. be pushing it. Uh, but I mean, like, it's another. I mean, it's it's basically on par with the rest of the Eye of Creation, where it's like I play Eye of Creation and I either go nuts or lose. <laughs> yeah, I don't think we should make cards equal in power level to Eye of Creation to balance out Eye of Creation. So, uh, Bunjitsu is two blood. You need double blood. Uh, basic cost five. Void two troops you control. Create the abomination. This is the one that's been broken forever because it's been creating two abominations. And, like I tell people, and they're like, "Oh, it's not broken. It's supposed to create." two abominations that are both the same that are really big that's awesome <laughs> why would I not want it to do that but basically you're sacrificing two troops to make one really big troop um, it does it It used to just be their power and toughness now it's three plus their power and toughness so it's better in that way but basically you've gone from uh, two targets your opponent has to deal with to one which seems pretty yeah. bad to me seems so. bad to me as well just as bad I, as it I was. imagine you're playing it when you're sacking two troops that you don't care that much about, which means they're not going to make that big of an abomination for you. Sure, you no. can kill two Shin Hair, but that just makes right. it a 3 5, which is terrible. Yeah. Well, it's not terrible, but it's not what you want out of a hero power. So we got about 15 minutes left. We're going to move on to the okay. deck the deck doctoring portion of this, the, the namesake of the, the thing. And we've got this wonderful, wonderful Skarn deck which was uh, off course, uh, decided to send over to me. And we're going to make the cards a lot bigger. So we start out, we've got, he really wants Kindling Scarring to happen for this deck. So first thing we have to decide is what other uh, color we're going to, or what other shard we're going to be in, if any. Um, he's already in Sapphire, which isn't a bad choice. Uh, Zubrin and I talked about that uh, in limited uh, quantities before this. So I'm already seeing some problems, though. Incantation of Ascendance, Chimes, 
I, I tested it out. Nothing buffs this guy except for actual basic actions or quick actions. So troops don't buff him. Artifacts don't buff him. Constants don't buff him. I mean, it says it's kind of a, a little bit confusing because it says um, whenever you play an action, what's an action? So an action is basically basic action or quick action, not constants or artifacts. So I'm already seeing problems there. Fulmination isn't too bad, even though it's a constant. It's going to draw us more cards, which gives us more fuel to hopefully turn Skarn over. Um, we've also got Time Ripple in here. This is a tempo-y kind of card. Uh, Oracle Song isn't bad because we need to draw cards to play cards. Archmage also does some sort of a job just like that. Of course, we've got the obligatory Rage Fire Burn and uh, some Sapphire, Ruby Shards, and Shards of Fate. Now, he's running a ton of shards for this curve right now, which we, we're, we're, we're going to fix that too, because he's running, that's 24, 24 shards. Oh, I guess it's not too much. I thought it was more than that. So, first things first, we got to get rid of this Chimes. That's got to go, and uh, especially with yeah. the, the new nerf to it, uh, making it unique. Uh, Mastery Time doesn't doesn't seem that bad. Mutate is going to draw us a card. Probably not that great. So what other uh, shards should, do you think we should go into, Zubrin? Do you think we should stick with the the uh, Sapphire? Do you think we should go into maybe like Wild or maybe Diamond? Or what do you think? I like the Sapphire build partly just because there's a not there's a lot of new ground to be broken in that respect. Wild is a natural companion if you want to build a Scarn Wild deck that's perfectly reasonable and there's a good deck to be built doing that. Uh, but there's I think some more innovation in blue that hasn't really manifested in a lot of the proving grounds or tournament play yet. So I'm okay right. with Sapphire for that reason. Right. Yeah, I think so too. Um, I'm not a big fan of Time Ripple, but this is a tempo deck, so it probably does need Time Ripple, so we'll probably keep those. Yeah, I like um, Time Ripple. Our, yeah, in this deck specifically. Uh, Archmage, maybe. We'll keep maybe that one. I'm not sure so, about him right now. The biggest problem with this deck right now, as someone who's played Scarn decks, is that you don't have enough creatures. Yeah, and we need some more for sure. Yeah, it seems counterintuitive that you want a lot of spells, but... The, your opponents probably have removal of some sort, and so only having six creatures means you're probably going to die a lot to opponents and just have nothing to play. Right. And you also can't really run counter magic because you need to cast two spells on your opponent's turn. Yeah. Like if you do play the counter magic, you gotta play something else so that way you can flip your Scarn. You know, or not flip sure. him, but level him. Crushing Blow seems decent. Um, we'll consider it. I'm just putting basically considerations now. Gorfi seems pretty crazy in this deck. Definitely. Maybe as a one of. Uh, Servant is considerable as as an alternate one drop to Scarn in this deck, but mm -hmm. we have to make a lot of deck decisions around it. So um, yeah, I think, I think that becomes a different deck. Too yeah okay so too much obviously there. Benjamin doesn't do anything for us. Incantations, really and mentalist. Uh, draw. So what we probably need in here is the all the the lovely uh, Mirror Knight. I think. Well, no, because sure. we don't have anything to buff, do we? Right uh, we will, though, because yeah. I think we bring in Buccaneers at the very least. Yeah, so let's put Mirror Knights in here. They can buff each other. So, we'll, yeah, I think we'll go with him and Buccaneer is a good idea. There's probably a couple uh, others. Uh, yeah, there's probably a couple others we could get in here. Fiendish Cableist also seems good to me because we're drawing lots of cards. Our opponent's also forced to draw a lot of cards if we decide to keep that. So we'll just, just think about him for now. Um, so another, I, I just think he's an underplayed card. I've seen him, like, he's dominated me before. Crimson Clarity, I think, is a must in this deck. So living the dream for this deck would be, like, turn one Skarn, turn two Crimson Clarity, into turn into the same turn playing uh, uh, Oracle Song and flipping your Skarn. That's like living the dream for this deck. And then you draw your cards, replacing Crimson Clarity. Now, that's not yeah. really a great living the dream moment, but that's it. That's, like, the best I can come up with right now off the top of my head. So, I really card decks usually have Crimson Clarity in it, so I buy them. Yeah, because you get, it allows you to play two spells. It basically is, is one of those uh, cards that we see a lot in um, other decks where it is that you're trying to play lots of spells in the same turn. You know, this type of thing where you just get, like, short-term gain... Short-term... Short -term gain for long-term loss because you're basically giving up a card so you can come ahead one turn on your resources just for yep. one turn. 
Instead of the Archmage, I think we should consider Dreamer because that gets buffed by our knight, and you give him a gem that draws cards, and he's probably going to draw just as many, if not more, cards than. The, yeah, I uh, think Redlock. Elder Streamer is much better as well. In in a lot of ways, because he he doesn't need support to draw cards. That's the thing. That's the wonderful thing about Eldritch Dreamer. Hmm. You know, you just gem him, and he just goes to work. He does. He does. He does the work, so you don't have to. You know. Just like uh, great card. just like those little scrubby bubbles, you know, in the toilet. <laughs> okay, so um, ancestors so of chosen other... is another one that you could you could consider for this deck because he, he's he's a focus fire. They have to kill him. So, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a considerable <clears throat> one you could throw in. I you think the only something? one drop we really want is the Scarn. Maybe, it probably because... is. If we're going with the Inspire route, we don't want too many things that are below the Inspire, so maybe uh, Pyromancer might work. But I'm not sure how many two drops we want, and we still have to put a lot of spells into the deck. Right. It's another underplayed card. He's just he just costs like one too much. I think if he uh, if Wizard of the Silver Talon costs three, he would be played in like every tempo deck imaginable. Um, I think he's just it's just hard to fit him in. Uh, he just doesn't fit a lot of curves. We don't see him being played. Uh, which champion do we want? We probably want maybe the one that gives us flying to f make the scar and flying. We probably just want to draw cards. Which <laughs> really, realistically, we probably want Wyatt the Sapper, my my old mainstay. Yeah. So we already um, have Wyatt. But what do you think? Poka. <laughs> yeah, mean, that's Poka true. Poka is good for the pressure, and it gets inspired by our creatures that we're playing right now. So that's true. Uh, well, why it is someone you can argue for as well, but I think Poke is probably just another threat you want on the board. Uh, Ember Spire Witch, maybe in the sideboard for sure. Definitely in the sideboard, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I've been play. talking about that a little bit about trying to figure out a good anti eye creation deck, and one of the recurring problems is Colossus, and the Witch actually may have some playability there. It still dies to a squirrel, but so you force him to use a squirrel on two too. Unfortunately, with Thunderbird, we can't really viably play it in this deck, and the reason why is we're trying to play a turn one Scarn, and if we, and every time we play a turn one Scarn, we will never, ever play a turn two Thunderbird with our current resource base the way it is. Um, if in the future we are allowed to have resources that come into play and produce two uh, Threshold, then that becomes a little bit more viable, but uh, I don't see that coming anytime soon. So right now, Thunderbird really I want to put him in this deck. But at the same time, I know I probably shouldn't because it's just too clunky. Yep, you're right on that. Uh, peak is probably a big deal for this deck. Maybe? I don't know. It's going to let us draw, play two cards in the same turn, I guess. Um, let's see, what else It actually got? may have a more compelling role than uh, Oracle Song. It's probably actually not that good. What, Peak's better than Oracle Song? Uh, I mean, just as a replacement potentially for Oracle Song because you can cast it on your opponent's turn. That's true. And allows you to dig for something that you need at the moment. I'm not sure if it goes in place of Oracle Song, but I think given the way our deck looks at the moment, those two are in contention with each other. Grolk's like a, a, a must one of, I'd say, at the top of the range, because it can win games. It'll win games outright. Yeah. Especially if you, well, <laughs> actually that's never going to happen. It's going to say if you Gorefeast as well, but if you have nine resources and you're probably... Well, it's an alternate to Gorefeast, kind game. of. Isn't it? Yeah. It's like yeah. an alternate too. So it helps you maybe smooth out your uh, resource base a little bit. Yeah, so or you Master can always Grok, then Gorefeast the next turn. So I'm going to say that Master Theory Crafter is a lot better than what I gave him credit for because the Warbots that come into play have his gem slot, yep. which is pretty neat. <laughs> so just I in case you, someone was yelling at their screen at some point in time, yeah, I've had it happen to me where it won a game against me. Yeah. So, yeah. Me too. Someone was running the mill gem in draft, and it's like, oh, that's really they good. They ran the damage gem. Sad. So he just basically puts a war bot into play, and it's like three damage to the face every time. Yep, that's also very good. <laughs> that seems really good. Uh, he's a little bit expensive, so I'm not sure if he fits well into a deck, but he's worth a consideration. We can't really uh, play burn to the ground because that's going to make us want to exhaust all our resources. It doesn't really fit very well. It's kind of clunky with this deck. Ruby Lance is decent, a decent choice, though, as well. We could probably even play like a play set of Ruby, Ruby Lands. We're heavy into into Ruby anyways because we're Scarn. So 
I don't think I forgot anything. So now we just need to pare it all down and, and figure out where we're going to go. So our, our curve doesn't look too bad right now. You know, we have 85 cards we need to pare down. So <laughs> I, I'm going to go ahead and uh, remove a resource. I think we can get this at a 23 resource level. So just remove a random resource so I know how many cards we need to remove and make some choices here. Um, so we need to have lots of troops. So we have to choose. So probably the crushing blow is probably not that great. Mastery of time. Mm, Mastery of Time might be better than Grulk. I can't believe I'm saying that. For this deck that we're trying with what we're trying to do. I mean the big question is if you cut some of the five cost cards, if you have no five cost cards, you may be able to cut another resource as well. Yeah. So the other big thing is is it's like so Menacing Grulk, Mastery of Time, and uh Gore Feast all do similar things. So I think we need to make a decision on which one of these we want to play. So mm -hmm. we can already cut a card here. So I think we want to play a low curve. So we'll just go yep. Gore Feast and just get rid of Mastery of Time and Grulk. I hate getting rid of Grulk because he's so good. But I think we have to do it. So okay. that's what we're, the choice we're going to make there, I think. And again, when we're doing this, you're going to have to do a lot of playing around with the deck to, to get a feel for where it is and um, what you want to do. We could it. probably cut Mutate. Yeah, I don't like Mutate too much. Um very few times are you going to be able to kill something with this. I mean, I guess you can kill those birds with it that everyone says are so overpowered because they can block Vista Brigadon, but whatever. Can you kill birds <laughs> with it? Yeah, because you swap the power and toughness and, and now, like, you know what I'm talking about? The, the, um... Uh, no, Mewtwo got nerfed, though. It does something else now. Oh, it doesn't switch the power and toughness now? Oh, well. No, I think it says give minus one plus one. Oh, okay. Well, that's probably not good. Um, oh, it got way worse. That's Yeah, that's way worse. So yeah, we definitely want to keep these Mirror Knights, I think. Crimson Clarity. So the other thing that's neat about this is Crimson Clarity can give you an early Cableist, so we need to start looking at our three-point stuff and see what we can do on turn two with Crimson Clarity. We can't play an Eldritch Dreamer. There's crushing Blow, nah, I don't know. Oh, you know what? I had someone play this defensively on me before. <laughs> before, and they probably shouldn't have been able to do that. I'm not sure how many Fulmination, maybe two Fulmination? I'm never a fan of Fulmination, but I'm not other really. people are. I, I yeah. I mean, it just seems so many opportunities for them. They draw the first card before you do, and they have yeah. ways to potentially remove it if they're white or blue. Yeah, yeah. I think we can but actually safely get rid of it, really. It's probably in contention with Oracle Song and Peak as well. If you have the yeah, formations in it, don't run the other two. Yeah, let's But it's constant, so you're not pumping your Skarm with it. Yeah, and that's the other reason. So there you go. That's lots of reasons. Ancestor's Chosen will go and pull him because he's going to make it hard for you to draw those cards you need to get your Skarn to work. So we're going to get rid of him because um, he's going to throw all those Spectres in the deck. Not that drawing specters is bad, but you know you might run out of resources and you need two spells and all that, and it just becomes too clunky. Um, so where are we at right now? We are we've cut some things. We're at 73. We need to get rid of 13 cards. I'm really not liking Crushing Blow. I mean, is there, can you give me a reason right now, Zubrin, to keep Crushing Blow? Uh, uh, it pushes through damage. So if they have a bunny or something else, you can do more damage than you otherwise would. Um, do you it's like just, it? It's, I it does do cost have one. In my deck. Yeah, it knows. In my uh, wild ruby deck, it's another wild growth, more or less, except for one that can push through more damage. I think right. it's a good card. It's whether or not it's right for the deck, though. Yeah. Is it one of right now, or...? It's uh, one of right now, but I mean, we I, I just have it in there to look at it right right now. Yeah. Cableist is four or nothing, and I don't know if I'm feeling them now that we've gotten rid of... Now that we've gotten rid of um, whatever it is, the, the one that draws all the cards, yeah, we're going to get rid of him that draws cards for everyone. He, he doesn't work unless you have that. So, Yeah, so no, that makes sense. Uh, Time Ripple, Oracle Song, Peak. So I, we have to make a decision between Oracle Song and Peak. I personally like Oracle Song better than Peak for this deck because I want to draw sure. as many cards as possible, and I want to live that dream of playing Crimson Clarity into Oracle Song. I really no, you do. Me on that. I mean, the biggest problem with any rush deck is not having enough cards, and so it's probably better to draw two than draw one targeted card, especially since your threshold's not going to be that high with this deck. Yeah, a big thing that uh, Peak screams to me is control. You will play me in control because I will find the answer for you that you really, really, really need during your opponent's end step. That's what Peak is for. 
Oracle Song yep. is card advantage. This is like find the answer. So that's not what we're trying to do. We're not trying to like set up like some crazy combo. If we didn't draw Skarn in our opening hand, I mean we're kind of in bad shape to begin with, but I mean at least maybe we'll have like burn or something to uh kill our opponent's early stuff and then eventually get to Skarn later. Yep. I like having lots of stuff. I think we can go down safely to maybe two Ruby Lance for now, maybe get rid of them later. Yep. How many uh, cards are we up? Uh, I think we're at 65, so we only need to get rid of, like, five cards. I'm not a real big fan of Time Ripple. I think we can safely take it down to two. Um, we really can't get can rid of too many. Can we go down 23 many. shards? We're already at 23, uh, so yeah, there's okay. four, and that's uh, plus nine and ten. That's 19, so that's 23. We're already at 23 shards, but we only need to get rid of three more cards to uh, to kind of... Our, our curve looks excellent, just, you know, just saying. Um... Well, if Crushing Blow is a one-up, we might as well cut now, and we can bring it back in if it's uh, if we're not pushing through damage we need to push through. Yeah, I mean, we got to count up how many troops we have to use it on, too. I mean, we've got, what, 4, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. So it's not that bad um, as far as how many troops we can actually cast it on, but sometimes it's nice to have things that work even if you have troops on the board. So um, if you're going to run it at all, I'd say run on one of. Mm -hmm. Our Buccaneer probably could be a 3 of because we're usually using that to gain tempo. Yep. Yeah, I think we're almost there. Almost there in time to finish out this episode. We could probably maybe go down one on the Oracle Song. I won't be living the dream as much, but, um, you know, I can at least dream about living the dream. Mm -hmm. uh, so this should be interesting, if anything. Um, it'll either explode in your opponent's face or it will... Uh, it will not do anything, I think. Uh, <laughs> like, that's the big problem here I'm seeing. Uh, I don't know. We'll see. I, I might try it. Gore Feast could be really interesting in here. Um, you're, you're playing Ember Spire Witch. You might play Counter Magic in the sideboard, like a two of, if you're, if you're worried about, like, sweeps and stuff. Maybe a three of, just to deal mm -hmm. with sweeps. But that's probably the only thing you would bring it in, because you're just going to try to aggro and beat your opponent's troops. Um, the top level of Kindling Skarn says... When you play an action, it gets plus three, plus three. Again, it would have been nice to give that crush. So maybe that's one more reason why you want to run uh, that crush card. But um, seems pretty interesting. So I'll make sure to uh, put this on the comment section. And this will, of course, be posted on the YouTube when we put this in the syndication. So uh, tonight on Deck Building with the Squire, I had Zubrin, Champion of Champions, of the last <laughs> CCG Pro <laughs> tournament on my streams. The first time he was on, he graced us with his presence. And uh, he's Thank you also for doing. Me. Oh, you're welcome very much. Uh, he also does the two turns ahead. He's been on quite a few of those podcasts, so make sure to check him out on those. He also administers the forums for the uh, Reddit forums, and he was nice enough to bring me on for that. So uh, I really appreciate that. You know, I'm sure um, he can use a little bit of help here and there, although he's, he's got a pretty good handle on it. And, um, yeah, we talked about the patch notes, some RNG articles. We did this deck doctrine with the Skarn. Um, just talked over a couple of different things. Today, just, just so everyone knows, let's just, like, throw up our hands and, like, get excited because all the cards for PvP are in the game right now. So everyone should get excited about that. There should be, like... I don't know, like, don't go, like, and do a Detroit on me and, like, like throw, like, some bonfires on, like, some cars or whatever and, like, start, like, overturning cars or anything, but, you know, it's okay <laughs> to have, like, a block party and, and keep it civil, you know, or maybe just have a beer or something, but, um, yeah, celebrate, because this is a milestone day in uh, Hex, so, uh, <laughs> other than that, um, Zubrin, did you have a sign-off line? I, I hate No traditional sign-off. No, no traditional sign off. So this but is Aaron thank Squire you again for off. having me. Yeah. So. All right. So uh, this is Aaron Squire signing off, saying God bless you and your families, and try not to rage too much out there. <laughs>